I'm Kevin Owen uh, here at RT tonight. I'll update the latest headlines for you very shortly, but Dima is here with the business after a quick break. Elsewhere around the world tonight, there's renewed violence in Yemen. In separate incidents, an anti-government protester was killed by a motorbike gunman, and then a policeman died in clashes. It comes a day after security forces opened fire on demonstrators in the capital Sana'a, killing at least five. The victims died of gunshot wounds and nine others are in a critical condition. Meanwhile, the UN, which held a meeting on the crisis in Yemen, failed to agree a diplomatic response. Heavy gunfires erupted in the Ivory Coast capital as forces loyal to the new government try to dislodge the militia of the deposed president. It's part of attempts to re-establish security following heavy fighting earlier this month to oust Laurent Gbagbo. He was arrested last week with the help of UN and French forces during a raid on his residence in Abidjan. This is our team. My name is Kevin Owen. Welcome if you've just joined us. It's now 9 p.m. here in Moscow and the top story tonight. France has promised to intensify airstrikes in Libya at the request of the opposition there. It comes as NATO allies are getting ready to send military officers to the war-torn country to advise rebels on how to break the stalemate with pro-Gaddafi forces. Let's get the latest reaction to this news tonight. Artie's Laura Emmett's in London for us. Laura, hi there. So the UN resolutions allowed foreign forces to enforce a, a no-fly zone over Libya. Many are arguing, though, the latest move by the Allies goes against their initial mandate, doesn't it? What, what uh, reaction are we getting from London tonight? Well, uh, people are, are talking about these military advisers. Uh, we've obviously heard that the UK, France and now Italy as well are going to be sending what they're calling military advisers, senior uh, army officers who are going to uh, Libya. We understand that there are going to be around uh, 10 uh, advisers from each country. Numbers not exactly clear. They're going to be armed apparently in order to protect themselves, but they're apparently not going to wear uniforms. Uh, and they are there to organise uh, the rebels, apparently, according to uh, Foreign Secretary. William Haig and not to train or to arm them. Haig says that they're going to be performing, uh, they're going to be helping the rebels to uh, aid their intelligence gathering, also to improve their logistics and to improve their communications facilities. Uh, along with this, we've heard the foreign ministers of Italy and France uh, reiterate that they've got no intention on the back of this of sending in ground troops. But nevertheless, uh, this does significantly up the contributions of all those three countries in this intervention in Libya. And, of course, what we're hearing from the anti-war lobby and from those members of parliament and, and the people who were opposed to intervention in the first place is that this is the most significant move yet towards uh, sending in ground troops into Libya, which is something that the, these governments have said that they are not going to do. Uh, but this has been a day, uh, quite apart from that, of really upping uh, the, the contribution of various NATO members into the intervention in Libya. Sarkozy, as you mentioned, the president of France, he promised the rebels that he would increase the intensity of the airstrikes that France is performing. And also we've seen uh, the United States pledge $25 million in aid to the rebels. Now that, they say, is not for weapons, but it's to be spent on vehicles and medical and communications equipment. And Laura, what reaction from Tripoli then to all this? Well, Tripoli obviously is not pleased. Uh, the Libyan foreign minister said that this would uh, could worsen the situation and significantly prolong uh, the fighting, thereby putting any kind of peace deal significantly further into the future. He said that it would encourage defiance in the rebels, that they would perceive themselves to be getting much more support uh, from NATO than they'd previously been getting, which would make them keep on fighting for longer. And he says this is a clear violation of the uh, UN Security Council resolution that uh, only uh, allowed for the protection of civilians in Libya. We've also seen division inside the UK Parliament. People are calling this mission creep. They're saying also that it was outside the bounds of the UN Security Council resolution and that it contributes massively to the ultimate worry that ground troops would be uh, sent into Libya. They're comparing this situation with Afghanistan, saying it could turn into another Afghanistan, where of course uh, British forces have been involved there for 10 years and counting. Uh, and also that the UK has learned nothing from Iraq or Afghanistan, that they're applying to this conflict. But in fact, a prominent Liberal Democrat politician has gone one step further and is talking about Vietnam. He says that the first step that the US took before it went into Vietnam and got so embroiled there was just this, to send in military advisers. 
Laura Emmett, our London correspondent, thanks for bringing us up to date there. All right, well, we stay in London now for a moment. Lindsay Germans from the Stop the War Coalition. She joins us uh, from there to discuss the NATO actions in Libya. Uh, thanks for being with us on the programme. It's appreciated tonight. How legal, as you see it, is the plan to send these military advisers now to the rebels' headquarters in Benghazi, then? Well, I don't think uh, you can see it as a legal move. Um, it clearly goes well beyond the bounds of uh, UN Resolution uh, 1973. We were told explicitly a month ago this would not happen. We were told there would not be troops on the ground. We were told that um, this would be simply a no-fly zone to, uh, to help civilians. Um, we've now had more and more indication that, uh, that the British and uh, French governments in particular, but also the United States, are really going for something much more substantial and uh, they had the articles in the papers last week which said that really there had to be regime change this again is not uh, is not sanctioned under uh, UN uh, resolution 1973 so I think it's a, a very very serious development more and more people talking about a, a military creepers they're putting in uh, uh, there's a view isn't it that sending military advisors to Libya is is now just the first step in launching a ground operation how likely is that though given that so many of the NATO allies have indeed spoken out against it well, I, I, this is a problem for the British and the French in particular because uh, it's clear they have very few allies when it comes to actually doing anything in Libya. But I think you're right. This is a form of uh, mission creep that they will send these people in. Uh, there will be more and more incidents. They will draw in more and more troops. This is uh, what happened with Vietnam. It's a very common uh, development if you look at uh, if you look at the ways in which wars in which wars develop. And I think that. We have to be very, very much opposed to it. You see, it's no good having a whole series of governments around the world uh, opposed to, to this development if nothing happens and if they are allowed to continue with this because it is a thoroughly irresponsible uh, action. It is designed to, uh, to escalate the war. And we certainly in this country will be doing everything that we can to, uh, to oppose it and to draw people's attention to it. A number of MPs have already criticised it. Parliament is at the moment in recess, but it, it returns on Tuesday. And um, there will be people uh, making, uh, making speeches complaining about this, um, mm. this particular development. But in general, we need to, uh, to mobilise public opinion much more widely. Lindsay, taking into account the, the, the lack of support you're talking about, can you try and describe for us why Britain is so keen to still be involved and push this further at a time when it's cutting its defence budget uh, back at home? Well, well, I think many people in Britain are absolutely astonished that, uh, that Cameron tells everybody here we don't have money for schools, the health service, libraries. But uh, these cruise missiles are costing one million US dollars each to fire. Um, the war is costing millions and millions of pounds a day. There isn't the money. The, the truth is the British do not have the money to uh, um, embark on yet another war after the failures in Afghanistan and Iraq. They do not have the political support to do it. I think that there are a number of reasons why they're embarking on it. Partly they feel they have to maintain their, they want to maintain their own face and their own, uh, their own prestige over this. And I think both Cameron and Sarkozy in different ways are interested in uh, this. They also want to rehabilitate humanitarian intervention, um, which has been so discredited in recent wars, the whole doctrine of humanitarian intervention. And I think that uh, in addition to this, they are scared that the whole process that we saw earlier this year in the Middle East, particularly in Egypt and Tunisia, will go out of their control. And Libya is a means of reasserting um, Western control in Arab and African so countries, Lindsay, where is that it, is what they're doing. Where is all this going to go? Obviously, this latest move has been uh, criticised by Tripoli. They're saying the decision to send international officers in uh, pushes the two sides even further away from any possible agreement. After two months of clashes, 10,000 killed, how likely is it that peace can be reached? Is there any, any uh, value in this uh, latest train of thought, I guess, from uh, some of the NATO allies that this short-term pain is going to bring some gain? 
Well, we've heard this so many times before. We heard it over Afghanistan. We heard it over, over Iraq that, you know, you just have to uh, put up with these wars because they will bring very rapid gain. They haven't. And they've, they've, there, are very, there are now, you have Libyans on, uh, on the media here saying we'd like Western intervention. We had exactly the same uh, as this with yes, Afghanistan and Iraq. Very few people now would, would defend these, uh, these wars and these, uh, these occupations. And believe me, if Britain and France go into another war like this, if they do um, invade the country, which it already seems that they are going to do, this will be a huge political and military problem for them. I don't believe that they're in a position uh, on their own to really, to really win here. But more importantly, already we see at the very beginning of a war, when normally wars are relatively popular, um, among the population as a whole, we're seeing a very great level of discontent. It does feed into the economic crisis, as you said, that people feel, why should we suffer economic pain when uh, there seems to be limitless money for these wars? So all of these things will come together. Lindsay German from the Stop the War Coalition uh, joining us on the programme from London tonight. Thank you for being on RT. Thank you very much. The US soldier accused of passing thousands of secret government documents to WikiLeaks is to be transferred to a new prison. Bradley Manning had been held at the Marine base in the US state of Virginia for the past 10 months in conditions that his supporters claim amount to torture. Professor Lawrence Davidson says that Washington's trying to make an example of Manning to serve as a warning to others. US government probably has already achieved its objectives in, in this case. I mean, uh, they've treated him so harshly and so severely um, denying him his basic rights, really, both legally and in terms of human rights, that the warning is out, that the, the, the message is out that anybody else out there who, uh, who wants to do this, who's a U.S. citizen and wants to, to be this kind of informant, is going to be treated in the most harsh way. His, his or her life will be ruined just like Manning's life is being ruined. They will keep him and they will deal with him very harshly. And it, it, he'll, he is an example for others not to do this. The US government is going after um, many of the supporters of WikiLeaks, uh, both the people who work, work with, with them and also the people who give them money. And, and so it's a general uh, sort of a, a wide net that they're throwing. You don't see much in the, in the media, but uh, they're, co they're under constant investigation and surveillance, a lot of these people. Um, and so they're very nervous. And uh, many of them in, <clears throat> who live in Europe are afraid to come back here into the United States. Dmitry Medvedev has been called showing off his moves on the dance floor. A video of Russia's president shaking his stuff at a reunion with university friends last year has become an internet hit. Here it is. And there he goes. Medvedev could be seen getting down to the Russian 90s hit called, if you're interested, uh, American Boy. One Twitter user, less than overwhelmed though by the presidential prowess, described his style as dancing like a dad. Russia's leader said he and his friends were just having a good time, though he admitted his moves may be a bit stuck in the 90s. Why not check out that video yourself if you've not done so? It was broken out in eastern Turkey after a ruling was passed preventing a number of Kurdish candidates from running in national elections there. Uh, riot police fired tear gas and water cannon at masked demonstrators who responded with stones and fireworks. Several people were injured in the violence. In the wake of the unrest, Turkey's top electoral body said it will review its earlier decision now.